Thank you. Thanks for that. So, it was a few years ago, and it was a really warm day, just one day, in the Arctic. It was minus 10 to minus 15 degrees Celsius, and that was the best that we could hope for. And we were the first day of this expedition to cross the remote penny ice cap on Canada's Baffin Island. Um, Baffin Island is the fifth largest island in the world, and it's the third time that I've been there on this particular expedition. I've done six uh, expeditions in the Arctic Circle, the other three being on the... Oh, excuse me. Uh, the other three being on the European side in Svalbard, Arctic Norway, and Arctic Iceland. So Baffin Island is the fifth largest island in the world, and despite it being <coughs> twice the size of the UK, no one's heard of it. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's only got 11,000 inhabitants, making it one of the most sparsely populated places on the planet. Our expedition was attempting to uh, cross the Penny Ice Cap, opening up a new route. Uh, we'll be travelling from Kikotajuak through uh, over the Penny Ice Cap and hopefully at the end of the expedition, a month later, end up in Pangington um, on the, um, you can see, you might make that out in the, in the, in the image on the right hand side. At the start of the expedition, we'll be dropped off by our Inuit outfitters to a place a little bit closer to the ice cap from the island of Kikotajua. Um, from there, they would leave us all our equipment um, and our food and our fuel. They'll leave us there and they'll hurtle back on their snowmobiles to the warm communities and leave us there to start the expedition. They often think we're absolutely mad when we undertake such journeys, um, but for me, uh, especially, I find that snowmobile, that initial snowmobile bill, uh, the worst because the wind chill is excruciating. But the views are marvellous. We pass icebergs that have been frozen, uh, that have been frozen in place on, and stopped on their voyage south by the freezing seas. And they tower above us, their stories above us, and the silence is, is, is deafening. And you can see, probably on the right hand side of the image, lower down, you can see a person and, and some of our snowmobile, and you can just appreciate the size. We pass seals that are sunbathing outside of the snow holes. And you see? Uh, yeah. We pass seals um, that are sunbathing in the, out of the snow holes, and as we're driving past close to them, they quickly scurry into the snow into the, sea, into the seas below. An Arctic hare race past us, somehow managing to uh, carry on up a 50 degree slope at the same speed. It's incredible. And then on this particular journey, we came across these footprints. And there's only one animal in the Arctic that can make footprints like this, and that is the polar bear. But as well as these large set of footprints that you see in the middle of this group, you can see two smaller sets of footprints side to side. And those are undoubtedly of a young family of two young cubs with this mother. And they're disappearing off into the distance of the same weight as we're going. And you can really appreciate the size of those footprints when I put my hand next to them. It's incredible. And so it wasn't long before we came up to the family of bears themselves. And it was a family, of a mother and two young cubs. And those cubs were probably only out of the den only for like a, a couple of days. They were really just stretching the legs for the very first time. But our noisy snowmobile spooked the mother and she ran really fast and we watched, we stopped and watched as the, uh, as the cubs and the mother were running, running away and the cubs were struggling hard to keep up. And as we watched, we saw one of the, one of the cubs falling further and further behind until there was a point where the cubs stopped in its tracks and totally, utterly confused about what to do, it turned around, looked at us, barked, because that's the sound that actually better bears make, which I didn't know until then, but and started running towards us. And that was the cutest thing I have ever seen, the second <laughs> cutest thing I have ever seen. But also the most heartbreaking, because that cub cannot survive by itself. It was decided that it would have to intervene. So with our snowmobiles, we chased the cub back into the right direction, and it worked partially. Um, it found its mother's foot tracks, foot, footprints, and started following them. But his mother hadn't waited. By now she was kilometers away, as well as the other cub. Um, and, and we knew that that cub would probably not make it back to its mother. So we decided we were gonna have to intervene further. So we used the snowmobiles as pincers, and we tried to block off its path before jumping off the snowmobile and trying to grab the young cub 
um, and to try and bring it back to his mother itself. But that's easier said than done. Polar bears don't like to be caught. His teeth are sharp and his claws are long, and he didn't stop without a struggle. I managed to capture the end part of this story in a short film. We're trying to get this cub back to its mother. Um, but it, uh, of course, doesn't want to be caught, and it's going to bite. At this stage, I took over driving one of the snowmobiles and I could not video record and drive at the same time. The next clip you see is after we have caught the bear using the tent to prevent it and us from getting hurt. We'll just take it to the yeah. mother. So at the end of this epic, we've caught the polar bear and uh, Billy's just taken over from me from driving and we're releasing the other pedal bit. There he goes. He's just attacking, oh, he's got caught. He's going the wrong way. So the mother's on the hillside, and the cub, there he is, and there she is on the hillside. She's now waiting for him, and uh, hopefully he will get to her. There's the mother, and the other cub, and there's the baby. Polar bear trappers. How high? That's a bit unusual for the mother just to leave, just like that. She was very scared. They usually wait for the cub. How high? It's a good thing we catch up the little one to the... Yeah. What's your bed? Absolutely amazing to see that family reunited again and a cup to be accepted back. But by now we were many hours behind our e expedition start and we were, um, and we had to, and we used up most of our fuel in chasing that cup. The only way we could get to that expedition start point was to cannibalize all the fuel from one snowmobile and us all pile into the existing final snowmobile and get to our start point. As the sun began to set, we uh, unloaded all our gear and uh, we started making camp as the, as the night time descended and the temperatures dropped. And Billy and uh, Billy and Charlie are in the outfit as they then head tailed it back to the community, probably driving all throughout the night to get there. But at least they had a warm bed to get to. Um, Billy, uh, in your outfitter that you saw in that film there, um, he was telling us that actually they are seeing more and more polar bears in the village. Um, than, than ever before. But scientists who have been studying the polar bear populations are becoming increasingly worried about the polar bear. So um, which of these are, is right? You know, um, either there are more polar bears or there aren't. Well, bizarrely, they both are, but that is not good news for the polar bear. The polar bear is a highly adapted uh, Arctic predator that has taken as an evolutionary process that's happened over thousands of years. There's a thick, dense fur um, leaving no skin exposed, and each hair is hollow, allowing to trap as much air as possible for insulation. It has a thick layer of fat which keeps it insulated and keeps it buoyant for those cold Arctic swims. It has these huge feet that help disperse its weight on the snow, and bumpy footpads that allow it to grip and run on slippery ice. Its uh, huge feet make for great paddles too for swimming. It has strong and powerful limbs, and that long and narrow skull combined with very strong neck muscles means that the polar bear is a bold predator, allowing it, allowing it to jump head first into the snow um, and to catch seals and have the strength to pull them out. The polar bear 
does all of its hunting on the sea ice. It relies on the sea ice for all of its life functions to track and find a mate for breeding, um, to find prey, and, uh, and it only survives on land um, with the uh, fat reserves that it has developed over a successful season of hunting. But the sea ice is more important than just for the polar bear. The sea ice is underpins the entire Arctic food, the entire Arctic food system. It acts like an upside down soil, where at the, um, on, the, on the underside of the sea ice, algae and other photosynthetic phytoplankton can grow. This is fed on by small little animals called copepods or, uh, or other zooplankton. And in turn, these are fed on by Arctic cod. Now, Arctic cod is the main staple food diet for almost every marine Arctic species, from, um, uh, from the beluga whale to uh, the narwhal to almost every Arctic seal species. So in short, no sea ice means no cod, and that means the whole entire Arctic food system breaks down, and the sea ice is disappearing. Uh, periodic data from, from NASA's satellites uh, from 1979 to recent times shows that on a decade by decade there's been a 30% drop in sea ice uh, continuously over that time. In September 2012, uh, the sea ice reached a record low and it was estimated that only 20% in volume of sea ice existed in comparison to 1979, which isn't a very long time frame at all. It is incredible um, and, and it's completely unbelievable about how quick that sea ice is disappearing. And um, the sea ice um, uh, may not be around until, uh, when I first wrote this uh, presentation a few years ago, it was estimated that the sea ice in the summertime will be around uh, in the 2050s, and that's when it will disappear. That has already been uh, reduced to something like the 2030s. The sea ice is, uh, is reducing due to the warming atmosphere and the climate. And that is due to surging carbon dioxide and methane em emissions that are pushing uh, greenhouse <coughs> gases uh, to record levels. And it's that instability in our climate that is, causing, um, that is causing sea ice to melt. Recent studies have been comparing uh, the levels of greenhouse gas emissions that exist today to the last time in history when they were at similar levels. And the last time they, they were at the similar levels as they are today was 2.7 million years ago. And at that time, sea levels were 20 metres higher. Now that could very well be, in fact, that is the best estimate of where a well will get to uh, and, and um, uh, will stabilise at. Now, that certainly won't happen um, in, in our lifetimes um, because it takes time for these, these actions to happen. But, if there's any chance that we have in order to prevent that from being locked in and from happening, the window for closing is, is only a few short years. So the melting ice means that there's less ice for, this, for the polar bears to go hunting and all of their functions on. So they're going onto land earlier and earlier, now looking for food. The keen sense of smell brings them into the human communities, and in particular, the rubbish dumps. And in that conflict between humans and, uh, and bear, it's always the bear that comes worst off. Now, I'm really fortunate about having this next uh, clip to show you. Um, uh, Silverback Films uh, gave me this clip to show you in my presentation, and it's a clip from one of their series called The Hunt. So, after that fateful day that we had with that, uh, rescuing that polar bear, um, uh, it took us 19 days uh, to get across the Penny Ice Cap. Um, and, uh, and, and it was for a land called the Ayotik National Park, which means the land that never melts. On the top left, top left picture there, you can see what our tent would look like in the mornings when the snow is developing on the inside of the tent. And we had to build snowballs each evening in order to stop the winds from blowing our tent away or destroying it. And we had to keep all of our skin covered up and leave no skin exposed. But after 19 days of skiing on the ice, we were only a day away from reaching Pangaton, the community, where we'll hopefully find a hot meal and, and hopefully a shower. And so we were really motivated when we went to bed that last night. 
um, to, get, uh, to get the paintings in the next day. But that next day, we woke up in a blizzard. The whiteout uh, confuses and disorientates, and you cannot tell the sky from the ground, and the only thing we could rely upon to find our direction was our compass. But we were really motivated. It was the last day we were going to get to a civilization um, soon. Uh, so we slowly continued skiing. Only about six kilometers away from Pangatan, you know, coming into the last couple of hours of what should have been the last couple of hours of the day, I came across a section of, um, of a dark patch of snow. And I was, I was ahead, I was leaving at this point, and, and that can only mean one thing, and that means that the snow is wet. And looking behind me at the tracks of my skis, I could see that the, skis, that the tracks were filling up with water. And now that can only mean one thing, and that is thin ice. But because in the blizzard of the white owl, I could not see, or we could not see, how far this, this area extended. Was it local? Was it extended? In which direction was the ice? So tensively, we took steps forward, checking that the thickness of the ice that it was solid enough before taking the next step forward. I hadn't progressed more than 100 metres when I, I heard the un unmistakable sound of ice cracking. And I whipped round and I could see Anthony in the distance. Great. But actually, there were three of us. Where was Duncan? And looking down, twisting further, I could see the dark chasm of a hole opened up in the ice and seeing Duncan having fallen through the ice into the sea below. This was an incredibly dangerous situation. First of all, we had to fight our urges to rush over to try and help Duncan because he was already in some really weak ice that's been weakened further by falling through. If we had approached this hole and it had broken further, we could have made this dangerous situation into a complete disaster if we had all fallen through into the hole below. Duncan had to get out of the hole by himself. So whilst Antti and I prepped a rope from some sort of extraction technique which we had no idea about what to do, we encouraged and shouted at him to get out of the hole by himself. So far, his, his suit and all of his insulated clothing were buoyant, but they were slowly filling up with water, and soon that buoyancy will become a dead lead weight and drag him down. He had to get out fast whilst, whilst he still had the strength and still had that buoyancy. After recovering from that initial shock, he moved to the edge of the hole. Fortunately, his pulp hadn't fallen down into the hole with him, otherwise that would have definitely pulled him under. And he moved to the hole and he put his <coughs> elbows out onto the edge and he tried to drag himself out, but the edge broke away and now the hole was even bigger. We shouted abuse at him to hurry up and, and do something more. Um, and so he moved again to the edge and again it broke away. This time we shouted, try a different edge, go to the other side of the hole, which he did. This time it held and he managed to crawl himself out of that hole and onto the ground, um, onto the solid, solid ice uh, that we were there. But now his clothes were soaked, his insulating clothing does not work when it's soaked um, and the blizzard was still raging, that wind was hitting us, whipping away all our heat. And so we had to move, keep him strong, but keep him, keep him warm, keep him strong, but we were also on really thin ice. And so began the most challenging period of the expedition on that last few hours. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but we did make it in the end uh, into Pangatan. Uh, and we saw the silhouettes in the distance of these geometric shapes, you know, square black silhouettes, and that does not happen in nature. And when we saw that, we knew that those were buildings and that the community was there. We were really surprised to see that at that time of the year, the sea ice was so thin that we were falling through. It shouldn't have been like that. It should have been thick enough for it to continue. But that is the new reality that we have to get used to. And in fact, one of the main rites of passage that explorers and adventurers uh, like to go on uh, is the skiing to the North Pole from land hasn't happened in the summertime since 2015. In fact, 2014, the attempts in 2015 all had to be rescued um, because the sea ice was too thin, and there hasn't been any attempts since. The only attempt that I know of this year is actually happening right now in the winter time, uh, in the polar night, because no one can trust the summertime, um, the summertime ice anymore. Now, will anyone ski to the North Pole in the summertime again? It's, it's highly unlikely. There are a few things to realise when we're discussing kind of climate change and what's happening in the Arctic. The Arctic is at the vanguard of, 
of climate change. The temperatures are increasing in the Arctic far higher than the rest of the world, but they are increasing everywhere the same, um, equally. And on top of that, what is happening in the Arctic has a big influence on what happens in the rest of the world, actually. When I first wrote this presentation, it was in the winter of 2015, and I was sitting in a cottage in the Lake District writing this, and at that time, it had the worst rainfall in the, over 100 years. The, um, a storm had passed through, bringing torrential rain that had broke away all flood defences and, um, and had flooded towns and villages and destroyed road networks. And that was a one, once in a hundred year event that happened. A week later, another storm came through. And a week after that, another storm came through. And so it was no surprise, actually, that December 2015 was the wettest uh, year on, on record, that it, what's this month that we've ever had. But it is pretty pointless about talking about these records because they have broken year on year on year. The, uh, the rate and the frequency of these extreme waves is increasing. And in fact, that, uh, that wetness that we experience can be directly related to what is happening in the Arctic by how the jet stream is being impacted. The jet stream is uh, a meandering, um, a meandering river of wind that is that, that travels from west to east, and it is the main uh, it's the main method of weather systems to be moving from west to east. One of the major important factors about uh, how strong the jet stream is is the temperature differential from the warm tropics to the cold Arctic, and when those uh, uh, when there is a large differential, so there is a, a warm tropical area and a very cold Arctic regions, the jet stream is strong and it's fast and those meanders that you see in the jet stream are very slight. However, in the instance that uh, the temperature differential is very, very, very low, so that's i.e. You know, a warming Arctic will cause this, that those meanders become larger and the jet stream gets slower. And those meanders brings weather with it, such as cold, wet weather that we experience. Um, that, we, that we are experiencing more and more in the, in the UK in the wintertime and, and flooding as a result. Uh, across the pond, that is bringing uh, intense cold, <coughs> cold spells into places like USA and Canada, um, and that is due to the effects of, of global warming, how the Arctic is being affected. However, the understanding of our political office and our political elite leads to uh, comments like this, which uh, which is completely, you know, which you can only roll your eyes to. On the flip side, um, you have extreme heating happening in uh, places like the Middle East. A particular study considered the um, a particular event that hasn't really occurred in all of human history, and that is when temperatures increase greater than 35 degrees Celsius um, in extremely extremely humid conditions well, the body can no longer sweat. And sweating is the primary means that our bodies use to regulate our own body temperatures. And if the temperatures are above 35 degrees C and the humidity means that you cannot sweat, it means the conditions are, are lethal if you're caught in an unprotected environment. This has never happened before, but this study and the models that they've created show that um, towards the end of the century, we're going to begin seeing heat wave and conditions like this emerging in the Middle East, in places mm -hmm. such as Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, and Doha. Now, uh, rich countries can afford you know, to pe have people in air-conditioned environments um, and air-conditioned cars, uh, but certainly the poor areas will become completely uninhabitable in these regions. But even in rich air regions, if your car breaks down somewhere in one of these conditions, well, it will be lethal. It will be a, literally a lethal condition on Earth to be, to be outside um, in an unprotected environment. All of these conditions is causing uh, issues with, uh, bigger issues with uh, our food security. Floods, droughts, extreme weather events, and more frequent um, um, uh, events is, is gonna cause uh, massive issues with, with security. This image here you can see in the middle of the screen shows, um, it's a bit hard to see the, um, uh, the colors there, but it shows the variability of food insecurity that is today uh, from going light gray, light beige color to a dark brown color. 
and here is an image of how that will change in 2018. So you can see that um, the areas that are that they see major changes in Africa, Southeast Asia, um, and and South America, and all of those areas are becoming all become more and more food uh, insecure, and that will lead to <laughs> greater regional conflicts and uh, environmental refugees greater in the millions things that we've never seen before. And we've already starting to see this, the, the uh, movement of people in Central America moving northwards to try and get into America via Mexico. Well, those are environmental refugees. They're moving because their crops have failed um, um, and they can no longer feed themselves. And equally, some of the reasons why people believe that there's a huge surge of, uh, of migrants moving from North Africa and trying to get across the Mediterranean into Europe um, is by is because that again is for, from food insecurity, and we can only expect to see more and more of this. And already, these events are already putting strains on the limits of the human rights that we hold so dear. And you can only imagine that this year upon year, those strains are gonna are gonna get bigger and bigger. But the worst is yet to come. Uh, I'm sorry to say, some. Of the things that climate scientists are most concerned about is these positive feedback mechanisms that could switch on. Um, some of them are already happening, some of them haven't yet started. And, um, and these are changes that have happened as a result of warming within our uh, climate, our atmosphere, uh, or on the land, or in the sea, uh, that then encourages further heating. And you could end up in a vicious cycle of the heating being encouraged by these events which then encourage these, these conditions to, to exacerbate. One of the worst, actually, is the, uh, what could happen to the permafrost. The permafrost, uh, here's an image that, of, of some sort of permafrost that I took um, at whilst in the Arctic, is a region of land about 19 million square kilometers, if I remember correctly, uh, around the Northern Hemisphere, which is permanently frozen land. And within that is about, uh, I believe, 1,700 gigatons of carbon that's sequestered within, within that uh, permanently frozen land. Now you can imagine that what's gonna happen that with the Arctic forming. Uh, that's all going to melt, and all of the, that carbon that's locked away from rotting vegetation and animals that have died over millennia is, is slowly going to emerge as methane, and it's gonna bubble up into, um, and, and escape into our, our atmosphere. The 2013 uh, IPCC report estimates that there is about 300 gigatons of heat trapping carbon pollution will be emitted into the atmosphere over the next 85 years. Now, you know, what does 300 gigatons mean? Well, if we consider that all of the human emissions of greenhouse gases between 1750 and today, that accounts for about 540 gigatons of carbon. Now, 300 gigatons is adding over 50% onto top of that, and that is without doing anything. Um, and th adding that on top of, of what we've already released, well, that would completely uh, nullify any attempts that we have in order to limit um, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing. Now, uh, paleo researchers, they've looked at the last time that all of that permafrost was melted, and it wasn't in a time when temperatures on Earth were on average 1.5 degrees Celsius higher than they are at pre-industrial levels. We're currently at 0.85 degrees Celsius um, higher. Um, and, uh, and the melting has already been starting to see in the, in, in, the, in the permafrost. And as a result, that methane is already starting to release. It is clear that climate change is going to have a negative impact all aspects of our lives, everywhere across the world. And it's clear that we have to do something about it. But there was good news when I wrote this presentation in 2015. It was the first time in history that after 30 years of discussions and uh, of talking of all these government panels coming together, 30 years they couldn't come to an agreement until 2015. And in Paris, they, 190 countries got together, every country in the world, and agreed that for a binding agreement to limit warming to two degrees Celsius. Okay, well, you know, the 
remember that permafrost stuff earlier, you can see that these, these targets don't agree with anything that science tells us. But it's a target nonetheless, it's something, something to draw upon. And a non-binding target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's the first time in history that's been done, and it's in, it was incredibly positive. The top graph over there, then it's just about legible, I guess. It shows, um, the red line shows uh, what would happen to a global average temperatures if we didn't do anything, you know, business as normal, as if we continue as we are doing today. And global average temperatures would approximate about six degrees uh, Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. And the blue line uh, shows how, what we will do to limit it to two degrees Celsius. And what that means is that if you move down to the lower graph is how that affects uh, greenhouse gases. And looking at that blue line, it shows that uh, we, need to really, we need to reduce carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions a year upon year at a greater and greater rate um, until the end of the century to have any chance of meeting that. So what has happened since? Um, so this uh, chart here shows the, um, the estimated current emissions trajectory. It's an estimate of where you know where we're going with the levels in, of emissions, and it's you know a steady increase of about 60 billion metric tons. Um, after the IPC, after the agreement in Paris, um, which is a binding agreement, uh, all of the countries had to come up with pledges about what they were going to do in order to meet their targets in order to to ensure that this two degrees Celsius target is met. And the next graph shows the collection of all of those pledges and how it will affect the trajectory of greenhouse gases. And can anyone see a difference between the two graphs? Yeah, it's, it doesn't really make much sense. And that's because the pledges that people have made uh, or the countries have made since then uh, have, have been you know, pretty much minor and certainly countries big emitters such as USA completely pulled out quite famously of the of the Paris Agreement. And to put it into context about what needs to happen, here is a chart showing what needs to happen with greenhouse gas emissions uh, year upon year in order to meet just meet the Paris Agreement of two degrees Celsius. Now we can already see, you know, based on some of the slides I showed earlier, about two degrees Celsius this is already a pretty a really bad uh, target to aim for. Um, <laughs> And so um, there's been a complete failure in our political system in, in able to, to deal with this crisis. Um, so far, I've only been talking about climate. So I've just got one slide here actually showing what else is happening in our biosphere. And, uh, and at the same time, as a, as a result of all of the same mechanisms that we are doing in order to create all of this, this climate emergency that we're facing, we're also creating the six greatest extinction uh, event that's ever happened. Uh, some people call it actually an extermination because it's not a benign event. We are knowingly causing this. And the most striking thing about this, these, these three graphs actually that uh, you should realize is that the 1970s wasn't a great baseline. Um, I'm sure the older members, anyone old enough there will be able to tell us that before the 1970s, biodiversity was already, wildlife was already plummeting at record levels before that. And certainly anecdotal evidence um, in, in papers and in, and, in, and in people's novels and, um, uh, is, is, is tantamount to that. And that is happening across the world. So let's bring it back to what is happening in what will happen in the UK. In a few years time, we're gonna to start to see crazy events that we'll never imagine that we'll be talking about in the UK about. I mean, water shortages in the UK, that's something that we would expect to hear about for sub-Saharan Africa. And we could start seeing major food shortages, not just in the UK, but if you're talking about continent-wide, it would literally be a bread line because there'll be no additional food that we can buy in from anywhere uh, to feed us. But I believe before all of this, one of the uh, greatest, um, uh, sorry, before all of this, our societies will be threatened by something that's, uh, um, um, that's going to happen sooner. And that is the sea level rises and extreme events such as flooding happening more and more frequent. And there's this village, Fairborn, in the Welsh, on the Welsh coast, uh, which is the canary in the coal mine at this, this stage. Um, and in this village, it's been, uh, they've been told that there's going to be no attempt about saving 
or, or, or creating flood defences to stop the village being flooded by rising sea levels. And overnight, all of a sudden, their greatest assets, all of the residents of this village, of, of this village their greatest assets, their houses, are worthless. You can't sell them. No one's going to buy them. And one of the, and that, and that is showing one of the greatest, um, or rather, one of the most important aspects of our modern lives. We, we live in this modern society with the knowledge that our possessions and our livelihoods are, are assured, are, are insured, and most of that is through insurance. Um, now, when we can no longer get that insurance, when we then, when insurance companies are no longer going to uh, insure our houses for flooding, um, then all of a sudden they're completely unsellable, and when they're unsellable, they are worthless. We're going to be seeing um, um, sea level rises greater than the one meter level that was estimated in Fairborn. Um, that, that has already created a situation in Fairborn. Um, all across the country. Now, I'm part of um, the all parties parliamentary, uh, uh, an all parties parliamentary group uh, um, in in, Par in 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 London in the um, at Parliament in London, and um, and being part of that group means I get to see some briefings and um, and, and planners about what's happening with with in, in conditions with the Paddy regions and how people are reacting to that. And we had one talk about uh, what the Thames Estuary 2100 uh, plan was. And the Thames Barrier plan is that they are getting ready to be uh, replacing the Thames Barrier with something that right. can deal with a two meter rise in sea levels. Now, is the rest of the country doing that? Um, and the answer is, is no, not at all. Now, certainly they don't have the budget. Um, but, but they're certainly not doing that. Now, what will happen in areas that, uh, um, that are quite low on floodplains, such as the Somerset levels? Now, there's thousands of houses there. When, they, when, when you can no longer insure those houses, they will be worthless. Um, and that will happen throughout many areas of the world. And, uh, and certainly, Sirencester, you know, how will Sirencester cope with a two, meter, uh, a two meter rise in sea levels? You'll see more and more extreme events, more and more flooding events. Certain areas of Sirencester, I'd say, would, would be experiencing flooding, upon flooding, upon flooding to the point that living there is, is pointless and we would to sell them. Um, so it's, it's clear that you know, this is an existential threat to all of our systems, uh, wherever you are in the world, and including being in a rich country such as ours. Um, and we have to find a new way of doing things uh, uh, and new technologies. <laughs> but some changes we cannot influence, you know, that's on governmental levels uh, and, and intergovernmental levels, you know, across, across the world, um, such as power and energy production, which is one of, of course, one of the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases. But there are major uh, impacts that we can make as consumers and can make. And we all know about, you know, cutting down uh, flying uh, and trying to reduce the amount of flying that we do. But we've got to look about viable alternatives. What we can do, what can we replace it with without you know, you know, changing our lifestyles uh, too much? Um, and we can still achieve having a, a fruitful life. And it's about viable alternatives. And one of the great, the biggest industries that we can uh, affect every day actually is the, um, is the animal agriculture industry. And that accounts for 14.5% of all greenhouse gases uh, emitted. And that is greater than the entire transport uh, industry combined. And the reason for that is that uh, livestock, and in particular cattle, have a unique digestion system that emits methane out uh, of, their, of their digestion system, and their waste produces nitrous oxides. Now, both of those products are many times as uh, powerful as greenhouse gases, as potent as carbon dioxide, with methane being 25 times as potent and nitrous oxide about 300 times as potent. On top of that, it is extremely inefficient. And, and in fact, I was quite shocked when I saw this statistic that livestock is the greatest impact that we're having on the world, uh, where 30% of ice free land is dedicated to livestock farming. Uh, and it's, you know, it's greater than what's allocated as wild for wildlife, which only counts as 25% of ice free land. It is clear that the two degrees C Celsius target 
or any target to, uh, has to include a dramatic reduction in livestock farming. And that has to start with demand and meat and dairy has to be reduced significantly. But like I said, there are also other industries that have to be impacted and that doesn't start with demand, that starts with pressuring governments and governments and intergovernments to do that. So, you know, it's blindingly obvious of what we've seen in the last few slides that things need to happen. But why haven't they? Well, in the current political economic situation that we're in, there hasn't been any competitive advantage for countries to go unilaterally, go greener. Um, and when we are, you know, when we've got a system about uh, creating perpetual growth in the finite, finite planet, well, it's always a race to the bottom. As Bill Clinton said, as uh, when he was uh, being elected for US president, it's about the economy, stupid. Um, and that is the short termism that we're, we're trapped in. And so we need to find a different way of doing things. And if we cannot win within and, and find a different way of getting through this in the current system, well, then we need to change the system and we've got to fight by different rules. And that's where um, places like, um, that's where groups uh, like uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, come in. Um, and they're important in, in spreading the word about what is actually happening because it's clear that politics has failed in dealing with this, and it is an existential crisis that we are facing. Um, and their demands actually look really quite, quite, um, quite obvious really. I mean, the first thing they're asking for is that, well, if everyone knew exactly what is happening to our climate across the world, um, um, then, you know, the citizens will demand change. Um, and so the first uh, demand is that governments take the ownership of that information and properly, and properly uh, distribute that out uh, without uh, whitewashing it or trivialising it. Um, their second demand, and actually I also think that this is important as well, they're saying that changes has to happen very, in a very short time, massive change in 2025. Now you saw from those graphs that, well, you know, change should have started a long time ago. Um, one of the uh, main uh, arguments that the government uses about what they're doing, they, it, they say that change, will, we're going to make change in 2050. And, and, and well, that's another way of pushing the problem out to someone else and saying, it's not my problem, someone else can deal with it, and 2050 um, uh, will come in. And you don't really need to deal with that right now and make those changes. And they're saying, no, you know, we need to do this year upon year, right now. And so they're asking for real change to happen on the governmental level right now by 2025. And thirdly, um, they have also said that actually, you know, politics has failed. Um, Parliament is not a good place for uh, such. It cannot deal with such an existential crisis itself. And they, they, they're demanding uh, uh, what is, what's called a people's assembly, a citizen's assembly, which is much like a jury service. Uh, uh, where citizens that are selected at random but uh, demographically uh, selected um, that they will deliberate information provided by experts uh, and then will chart the best course of action which will be legally binding. And that system will also allow, uh, will probably mean that it's far more exempt from the ability to, um, uh, for, 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 for lobbying which the Western democracies are, are so amplified by big business. Um, now that is all quite a lot to take in, so what can we do uh, about it? Well, there's stuff we can do individually, we don't have to feel so helpless. Um, so certainly we have to make changes in our own lives, and the things that, you know, in the consumption levels that we are producing, in our diets, in do we need to fly, you know, to the other end of Europe for a stag weekend, or, or could I just have a weekend at home instead? Um, and, you know, do I really need to have new fashion every, every week and, and just limit those sorts of um, those levels of consumption. Secondly, we need to support groups like what uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, are doing, and, and that's what, you know, in, in, in spreading the word and, and bringing that out. And would be that by actually attending their events or even just being sympathetic to what they're trying to do, which is essentially, you know, save our, our lives and our children's lives, um, uh, which is, 
you know, which is something I don't think anyone can agree with, uh, disagree with rather. Um, but thirdly, I think there's something quite important actually, especially in the modern age, and that is being responsible. And when I mean being responsible, I mean being responsible for the information that we, uh, that we take in, uh, that we digest and that we distribute. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of attempts to, uh, um, to muddy the waters with misinformation or trivializing points. And we've got to take ownership and responsibility for that by questioning uh, certain bits of information. Now, is there a hidden agenda? Who's funding this? And is that just an attempt to try and trivialize or is that the truth? And we've got to take responsibility of that. And if people are distributing such information, well, again, we need to take responsibility of saying, no, that's not right, you can't do that. And, uh, and we've, we've, got to, we've got to push um, uh, uh, for the right for changes to happen. It's a massive challenge. It absolutely is. And I see this massive challenge as, I see it's quite parallel to some of the expeditions I've gone on. And we, we, we enjoy hearing stories about, um, about expeditions, about adventurers going and undertaking uh, extraordinary journeys. Because I think we, we enjoy hearing them because they have succeeded when the odds have been stacked against them. Um, but, you know, they don't always succeed. And when I have an on, on the expedition, well, I don't feel guilty because I know I've tried everything I could to make that work. Um, and actually, that expedition that we, uh, we, we saw the polar bears and at the end of the expedition that uh, Duncan fell through the sea ice, that was actually the second time that we tried to uh, cross the Penny Ice Cap. The first time, three years earlier, we backed out after a week on the ice. We turned around after years of planning and pretty much all our life savings we spent on that. And we turned around because my feet froze, uh, my toes froze, and it would have been absolutely foolish to carry on. To carry on such at the beginning of the expedition would have meant I would have lost my toes, my feet, and potentially more. And it was the right decision, but I had to explain that to uh, my partner on the expedition, whose feet were fine, but you know we had to turn around. And it was the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my life, but it was the right decision, and. I don't regret going on there because we learned a lot from that expedition. And if we hadn't gone that expedition, we wouldn't have attempted three years later and we wouldn't have succeeded. And the views from the other side uh, are amazing. A few, uh, a year before this actually, and in fact you'll see this image is quite similar. Uh, we returned in the summertime to Baffin Island and we took a bunch of students and graduates out to Baffin Island to live amongst the Inuits and to uh, travel uh, uh, trek about 300 kilometers across the Ayusha Pass um, out there. And these students, <coughs> they were students and graduates from natural sciences. And the point of the expedition was to develop materials for, for schools, to interact via our web, web platform, our satellite phones, to schools across the, across the UK and the world. Um, and on top of that, I conducted a uh, video on, on climate change and what the, the members of the expeditions thought about climate change, and this was in 2010. However, we almost didn't get, I didn't, almost didn't get a chance to finish that expedition as we had almost had a disaster as a result of the extreme temperatures that we're facing. That summer, we, we had two weeks of temperatures greater than 20 degrees Celsius. Now, across this expedition there were a number of rivers we had to cross um, and these rivers are fed by meltwater coming down from the glaciers and this is a completely normal process and in the winter time that uh, those glaciers will be replenished in the, summer, in, in, in the winter time but the high temperatures that we were facing over 20 degrees celsius meant that the rivers were higher faster and crossing them became more dangerous but after three weeks and almost 250 kilometers of trekking gone, we were almost at the end of the expedition and we only had one more river to cross. We woke up at 4 a.m. Uh, this morning in order to cross the river when the uh, temperatures are at the lowest and the rivers as a result uh, are at the lowest and the melt hasn't really started too much. And of course in the Arctic you've got 24 hours daylight so really you know, 4 a.m. could be you know, 11 a.m. or 3 p.m. Um, and so here's a picture of um, Anthony and uh, Rachel, the other two leaders on the expedition, 
um, uh, attempt, you know, uh, attempting to cross to see what it's like uh, before permitting the rest of the group. And typically, we don't cross rivers that uh, are greater than our knees height because when they are greater than your knees height, it's hard to maintain a foothold in your and you're likely to slip and be washed downstream. And this is the last image that I took before we had to launch a, uh, before I launched a rescue operation. I had just moments before this, I had already instructed the other group, uh, the rest of the group to, to, to gather themselves into three distinct groups and position them further downstream um, as I saw that they were struggling. And already here, you can see the water is above their waist and they were struggling to keep their foothold. On top of that, the Arctic water is absolutely freezing, it's just maybe a degree or two above, uh, above, above zero. No sooner have I taken this picture that uh, they lost their footings and slipped. And as they slipped, they fell into the water and being dragged downstream. On top of that, their bags were now being flooded with water and then dragging themselves down, and they struggled to keep their heads above water. Fortunately, two of the teams further downstream managed to grab each one, uh, Anthony and Rachel, and dragged them back to shore. As well as being slightly hypothermic, their legs were battered and bruised, but apart from that, everyone was okay. And so I did manage to finish uh, this film, which uh, I'd like to show just a short excerpt of this of Rachel and Anthony discussing. The climate is changing, and we are contributing to this. But why should we care? Change. Why? Because. Um... Well, it's like, what, since time began, uh, it's estimated that 99% of all species on the planet have, have become extinct. And yes, that's nature's cycle and kind of that's that's the law of nature and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, we've how long have we really been around for in terms of, you know, how, how are we technologically advanced? Is it since the Industrial Revolution? Is it since the birth of Christ? Is it, you know, looking back further than that? You know, the environment we're, we're in here, these rocks are like 2.2 billion years old. Yeah, and in our, in our time scale, you know, what, Industrial Revolution, 150, 200 years? You know, it, in a whole scheme of things, we haven't been around for that long, but yet we're having the biggest impact on the, on the planet. Um, why is that important? Because, well, you know, we need to, you know, be very aware that we don't slide into that 99% category just yet. I think we need to, for the wider population, it's, we need it to conserve our environment that we thrive in so well, because it's the perfect environment that we can live in. But for me personally, I love the planet as it is. I want all the species there. I want to learn. I want to go into the rainforest and see them there. I don't want to go into a patch of grass full of cows for McDonald's burgers. I want to actually go into the Amazon. I want to be able to go onto the ice caps and see them and experience the world how it is. And then I think for the wider world, it's the environment that we thrive in. And we need it. <laughs> Well, we don't know how we're going to survive afterwards. Limiting climate change is not about saving the planet. This planet has endured climatic conditions that are far more extreme than what we are talking about. But our very evolution has been adapted for this relatively cool period in the Earth's climate, and all of our advanced technologies and societies relies on it. I would like to finish off with just reiterating what Rachel said at the end of that video. For me personally, you know, I want to go into the rainforest and onto the ice caps, but it's bigger than that. We need it, otherwise we don't know how we're going to survive. Thank you.